This video is sponsored by Norpass. More about them later in the video. And it's the dream of most structural engineers to be involved with the design of a super tall or super slender structure, as they can look at how they've changed the skyline of a city. However, it can be scary and daunting to be involved in one of these projects, but I've got some simple rules that will make the design of these buildings much easier. My name is Brendan, your structural engineer. Now let's get into it. When starting the design of any building, doesn't matter what height, it all starts in the same place. And it's about following the gravity load path from the top of the structure to the bottom of the structure, as that's the one major load path that you know you have. So what do you do? You look at all the floor plans, lay them on top of each other, and try and get alignment for vertical structure through your building. As you wanna try and eliminate and remove all the transfers wherever possible. As transfers is where all the cost goes in and where all the risk in the project becomes. Because if that transfer fails, you potentially have a catastrophic failure on your hands. And because it's a really dense area, it means that you've got a lot of reinforcement there and you've got a lot of depth in that structure. So when starting out, you're going back and forth with the architect, looking at the different floor plans and trying to adjust it. Now this is where you need to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with that architect. What is their dream? What are they trying to achieve? What size rooms and apartments do they need to have? Do they have big open floor plans for office blocks? So you can understand their physical requirements as you might be able to come up with better options for their layouts. But when you're doing those quick back and forth with the architects, what type of spans do you need to achieve between their columns is really important. And that's really where we go back to concrete basics. And between a slab is required for a couple of things. You need to make sure that it's sound insulated, it's fireproof, and also doesn't achieve the bounce. So the human perceived comfort is really important. So when we're talking about a flat slab, typically you're going with about a minimum of 200 thick, as that's roughly the minimum that you'll need to achieve those fire ratings and those sound proofings between the floors. So with a 200 thick slab, you can achieve somewhere between eight meters to nine meter spans, provided it's a post tension structure. Even in an RC form where you're not as efficient, you can still roughly achieve these type of efficiencies the only place where it may let it down is in those end bays, but provided you get some nice continuity, you should be able to achieve those same distances. So when you start laying out the floors on top of you, trying to put that grid on about an eight or nine meter grid, putting those columns so they can align through the structure and looking if you can adjust the apartment layouts to achieve the same effect. So you don't need many transfer structures. As we're looking at the loads and transferring them through the vertical structure, the next critical component is what are the size of those supporting elements? And they're typically columns because you're trying to limit the floor span and making it so they can have as big an open space as physically possible. As you want those lightweight solutions in there, so if they ever want to adjust apartment layouts, it makes them really easy. So when we're putting the columns out on those outer edges, there's a couple of things that you need to be careful about. You can work out roughly what the tributary area is by looking at the distance between the column adjacent to it and on the other side and where the other supporting structures are. And that gives you a rough area of the load applied to that building. And when you're running it down, there's a quick rule of thumb that you can do to work out what is the load on that column at any height. So you've got the tributary area, times it by the number of floors. Now you have that total tributary area on the column at that level. It'd be somewhere between 10 and 15 kPa. So what does this give you? It means that when you're on site and talking to the architect about where the columns are, what size they need to be, you can do a quick rule of thumb and go, if you've got heavier floors for whatever reason, such as an office block, you might be closer to your 15. But if you've got a residential floor, you can be safer around 10 or 12 kPa. So you can do a quick load rundown and go, the column is roughly needing to take this much load. Typically you want to try and limit it to 0.5 F-D. So that's the strength of the column. And now you will vary the strength of the column through the height of the structure. So at the top of the building, it'd be roughly 40 MPa. So that's upwards of about five to six stories. Below there, you're going upwards of about 50 MPa. Then as we move down the building, we've got up to 65 and 80 MPa. So a building roughly of about 14, 15 stories, we'll probably be getting upwards of the 65. And then below that, we're starting to drop up to 80. 80 will go down the fair way, the height of the building. Then once you're going upwards of 80 stories, you may be looking at 100 MPa at the bottom of the structure. One key thing that you need to be critical of is most buildings are broken up into typical floors. So from this height to this height, you've got a typical layout. Then the, this height to this height, you've got another typical layout. That's because the higher up on the building, you normally have more expensive apartments. So they're normally slightly bigger. So you wanna try and change the layout as you change through the height of the building. Cause you just don't wanna have the same apartment from top to bottom. So what does this mean with sizing your columns? Well, typically at the bottom of a layout change is where you wanna make sure that column is as small as possible. This is where you're achieving your 0.5 F-C 
At those interface changes, you'll keep the column the same size through the height of that typical floor. Now you'll just reduce the amount of reinforcement in because at 0.5 F-G, you're upwards of the maximum reinforcement in the column, which makes it expensive. But as you raise up a couple of floors, it'll drop off to minimum reinforcement really quickly. So that's a critical thing when you're looking at the load rundown is where do you change the column sizes? Typically it's at the bottom of those floor changes to make sure that you're maximizing the amount of area that the architect has available to them. Another critical thing about columns as we are maximizing the stress in them to make them as little as possible and maximizing the benefit of concrete underneath the compression, it means that you will get a fair bit of elastic shortening in them. If you do have a really tall building, you need to check the height of the column and sometimes you need to preset about one millimeter per floor to make sure your building doesn't sink too much on the outside edge of the building. So what does this mean? So it means that the outside edge is settling more than the inner edge. Now this brings up the next problem. Why is that? Well, typically the walls in the middle don't have as much load on them as they're a bigger area, supporting about a similar or lesser load. As they're more lightly stressed, they won't settle as much. So that means that when you do have those highly stressed columns, you wanna make sure they're a fair way from the edge of those walls. If they are close, you need to make sure that you're somewhat load balancing the load between the column and the wall, because what will happen is the load will come off that column as it becomes more stressed, loading up the wall, creating a differential in the floor. So sometimes you may need to increase the size of that column beyond that to make sure you're balancing it between the wall and the column that are too close to that central core area. But where possible, you're trying to move those columns away to maximize it. If the wall and the column are far enough away, so you're not achieving like a differential of about span on 500, you don't need to worry about balancing those stresses. But you can't always achieve that because of the layouts. So it's something to be careful about if you do have those wall columns closer to those walls is making sure that you're increasing the size of them to balance out the load a little bit in those locations. Thank you NordPass for sponsoring this video. NordPass is a business plan for advanced password and other credential management. With NordPass, you can easily onboard new staff or revoke access immediately meaning that you don't have to worry about insecure assets or changing passwords when staff leave. NordPass also allows you to have an unlimited number of company cards, so you have anything close at hand, so you can share not only both your passwords, but also those financial assets, meaning that you can securely transfer money and buy products whenever they're needed. Confidential information is also stored securely in one place. And with NordPass, you also have a data breach scanner that works 24-7 to identify when any vulnerabilities have occurred so you can get onto them as soon as they're there. If you'd like to see NordPass business in action, you can use it with my code Brendan Hasty, and you get a three month free trial with no strings attached. So what do you have to lose by trialing it out? When you start talking about walls, this is really where the fun comes into engineering. We're building those ETABS models and looking at how the building behaves. There's a couple of critical things that I look at. First up, you need to look at what is your critical modes of the building. So what does that mean? What is your first eigen, second and third eigen values? And seeing how the building is behaving. Well, typically the bane of any structural engineer is torsion. See, torsion adds a lot of additional stress, means you need a lot of reinforcement to resist those loads. Your first three primary modes, you wanna make sure they're in the correct order. So you wanna make sure that in the first one, it's a translational event in the weak direction as you're easily able to reinforce those translational movements. Then the second one is in the other direction. So the strong direction, it's still translational. But the third, where you want your torsion to be. You don't want it in that one or two event as it means that your building is more torsionally governed. So it means that you'll have more stresses that you'll need to deal with, especially in locations such as header beams. And also have a negative effect where you can have a compounding between those two moments overlapping with each other, causing a critical action. So you typically want to have one area slightly stronger than the other so that you can have a separation in those modes. Now talking about modes is how do you know if your building is too flexible or not? There's a general rule of thumb that will help you out here. If you know the height of the building, roughly divided by 30, that will give you a period number of where the building should roughly sit. So you look at the height of the building divided by 30 and see whether your period sits in the same region. Another rule of thumb, if you don't know the height in meters, because that 30 ratio is based on meters, is the number of floors divided by 10. So if you've got an 80 story building divided by 10, you're roughly sitting about in a period of eight seconds. So it gives you a rough rule of thumb to know where your building sits, as you don't want your building too stiff, or you don't want your building too soft. If it's too soft, the winds will shake it around and you'll get movement in there from even minor winds. Or sometimes if it's too stiff, 
I mean, if you've got too much structure, you're not being efficient with your design. So you can remove some of the stiffness in your building. So this is a good way to have a look at how your structure is behaving early on to see whether you're actually too stiff or too soft, or do you need to put more strength in a certain direction to stop those torsional movements. Now in those central cores, there's a couple of other key components is where the fun also comes in. So you have these things called outriggers. So what are they? Outrigger, like you see on a big ship or like a skier going down the hill. You see, with any building, it's the central core is relatively small than the outer edge. And we all know that stiffness is based on how far you can go out. So the wider you go out, you have a squared relationship that helps you increase the stiffness of the building and strengthen up those structures. So an outrigger is typically needed in a taller building with a single central core. So the outrigger helps stabilize the building by having you pull out those stability forces out to those outer edges. So as the building comes up, you have outriggers at certain levels for that building. So it means typically what it's doing is changing the curvature of the structure as a pulling it back and making it so that it doesn't lean over as much and pulling some of those stresses to those outer edges. So typically on a tall building, it's somewhere between two to three outriggers. And you'd want to try and average them out through the height of the building as you want to make sure you're pulling those curvatures back. But sometimes based on the change in cores or other elements, you may need to put them in different locations. But on average, you want them roughly in the intermediate points. So if you've got two outriggers, you want them roughly at third points. If you've got four outriggers, you might be able to put one lower, then two at different heights. And you can adjust them based on the central core. Something is really good to play around with. But you do want to be careful about those outriggers as you want to have a good connection with the core as you don't want to have a door in them, which will make them extremely ineffective. Although you can come up with other arrangements where you have strutting forces to make sure those loads can easily transfer through the structure. As they're all based on strut and tie actions, as they're really stiff actions, you're trying to pull the force out to that outer edge. So what this typically means is that you need to have a solid wall to the outer column, which is now upgraded itself from what is a standard column to either a wind column or a mega column, depending on where you are and how you call it. The size of the mega columns is one of the other areas we need to be careful as potentially not just based on strength here, you're also based on stiffness. So can it affect the strength of the building? So a good rule of thumb of when you're trying to size up those mega columns is somewhere between two to two and a half times what the gravity force would be in them. So you can start at that location, either pull it up or pull it down, depending on what stresses you're seeing in the structure. Now we've talked about some of the fun stuff of those outriggers, but how do we size the size of the core? Is it just the loads that are in it? Well, typically, no. The, typically, the cores are governed by their smallest element, which is those header beams, as you need access into those central cores, whether that be for lifts, whether that be for lobbies, whether that be for fire escapes. As you need to have access in there, it means that you've got areas of reduced depth, and that's where you'll have the highest stresses and where you'll need most of the reinforcement. Header beams, as the name suggests, they're a beam, and there's two ways that they're potentially governed. If they're really long and slender, such as a lobby, they, they're probably governed by flexor. As they've got a lot of distance for them to bend and twist. This means that you can increase the bending moment. As it's the two walls are sliding against each other, you haven't direct action between them. So you've got a shear and the distance between them is just the cause of that bending moment. So typically if you've got a, one that's more than about one or two meters, so they're not in a strut entire region of design, they'll be more likely governed by flexion. But if you're moving to a smaller door, such as a fire escape, which is about a meter, it's well and truly in that strut entire region. So typically those guys are governed by shear. So you're looking at those different elements and looking at which one are they governed by. And so that will typically govern the thickness of your wall as then most likely the critical element. And that's another reason why we want to move away from those torsion actions. As higher the torsion actions, the more the stress in those header beam and the thicker your wall structure will be. And typically it's the outer edge of the core that is the most critical one. People look at those central cores and go, which are the critical walls? Well, most of the time, because of that lever arm and how the actions of the walls are acting, much like any design, it's those outer perimeters that are the most highly stressed. So typically the central walls in the middle are governed by slenderness. So when looking at the walls, there is another couple of things that we need to be critical of. Yes, they are typically governed by the header stresses. However, you do have outer edges and corners, which can be highly stressed as well. And with the new requirements, you make sure those corners don't ever fail as they're typically boundary elements. And so they'll see a lot of tension and compression forces. So they're the most likely places to fail. So they're the areas that you want to over-strengthen and make sure they have enough confinement 
so they don't prematurely fail in any lateral ascents. So when do you know if you need to reinforce for them as boundary elements? It's a couple of things. If they ever see tension, it means they're going to see a lot of cracking. Typically, then you want to make sure you've got an additional confinement in there. And most codes now are trying to limit the stresses in those elements underneath those extreme events is when you need to watch out and make sure you've got additional confinements in there, especially in the Australian standards. This is where they've got a governing force at about 0.15 F dash It means that you need to start reinforcing those corner areas. And when you start to exceed 0.2 is when you're really trying to exceed those limits of the wall stresses. So when you're looking at the loads in there, it's not just looking at gravity, but it's also looking at those stability such as earthquake and wind loads. And you can spread it over a little bit of an area, not looking at the extreme peak out of stress of the wall, but spreading it over about half a meter or a meter of wall, they're similar to what you'll do in column interaction diagram assessments or beam design. Again, I'd just like to thank NordPass for sponsoring this video, where they have such tools as password generators and password health checkers to save your time. Check out the link in the description. Having covered some of the critical areas in the design of tall buildings, it's important that you also understand both concrete and RC design. I've got some perfect videos about the rules of thumb to RC design and steel design. They'll help you size up those structures even more effectively. And if you're interested in supporting the channel, there's two ways that you can do this. If you've got links to my Patreon or become a YouTube member. Now, I'd just like to give a quick shout out to both some new YouTube and Patreon members. We will have Tom on Patreon. We have Kim Mayers, Chi He Chong, Jing Wei Lu. Sorry if I butchered your name. Without the support of these, and my other YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content will not be possible. And as always, stay safe, keep learning, and I'll see you next week. Bye.